Crime Time Crimes presents this crime education video with two true crime stories. We suggest watching this video as the victim in each story. While watching, identify the warning signs that led up to the incident and think about what would you do to prevent this from happening to you or to someone in your family. If we can learn from these videos, we will be educated instead of just entertained. I respond to all comments so please leave a comment on your observations in this video and please provide any suggestions to make this channel better. And finally, please consider subscribing to Prime Time Crimes if you like true crime stories. Our goal is to move from being paranoid to being prepared. Thank you for supporting my channel. July 26, 2016, Applegate, Oregon. Surrounded by several members of his family, Shane Moore lies dead from a gunshot wound on his family ranch. And there's no shortage of potential suspects. The people that we identified as being there during the incident were uh, Shane Moore, Tucker Moore Reed, Kelly Moore, Lori Moore, Kelly and Shane's mother. Carlton Olison was there. He's Shane's roommate. They live together in the separate residence on the property. However, the woman who made the initial call to 911 is nowhere to be found. Carla Triver, the notary, was not on scene. She had left. While deputies fan out in search of Carla, investigators begin processing the scene, starting with Shane's body. There was a single hole in his shirt in the upper chest area. And then, as the medical examiner removed his shirt, uh, a single bullet entrance hole in the sternum area. Investigators must wait for a search warrant to get a look inside the house for further evidence. The residence had been taped up with caution tape to prevent any entry and exit to the crime scene prior to a search warrant being executed. While they wait, investigators get word that the notary, Carla Triber, has been found. When investigators speak to the shaken witness, Carla explains she was summoned to the ranch to assist siblings Shane and Kelly Moore with a property transfer from their elderly mother. What Carla told us during the interview was that she had received a, a call from Shane Moore to come up to the residence and get a quick claim deed signed, splitting the property 50-50 between he and Kelly. When Carla arrived, she found Shane's mother, sister, niece, and a roommate named Carlton, but no Shane. When the door opened, Kelly Moore was um, yelling the whole time, you know, what do you want? What do you need? It was just one right after another. And uh, we went over to the table. She wanted me to sit right in one certain space. I hadn't really seen the papers, so um, I picked them up to explain what it was and to read over them. Carla says that's when the chaos began. So the dispute was that they didn't know it was Grant Dean. They thought it was a will. So she comes back to the table and she grabs the paper that was to my left with my stuff. And she goes, that's a Grant Dean. I was told it was a will. She's not signing it, so she rips it up. That's when Carla spotted Shane on the front porch watching through a window. And she says, oh, that's just my brother. So when he got to the front, Kelly got up from the table and went over to the door. Moments later, Carla heard Shane's sister and a young woman confront Shane at a door just out of sight. She's wrestling with the door and saying, you know, he's trying to come in, he's trying to come in. And I hear the gun go off. Oh, good God. At that point, I was really, really scared. <laughs> I remember I just started talking, you know, to Grandma because I just, I didn't know what to do. When Carla finally realized Shane had been shot, she scrambled to contact authorities. I was shaking so bad I couldn't dial the phone. I was trying to dial 911. She really needed to leave, like, immediately. And that's the reason why she passed the phone off to just anybody that could take it during the 911 call and got out of there. Though Carla didn't see the shooting firsthand, she does know who wasn't on the porch during the scuffle. She had told us Carlton was not involved, that it was Kelly and Tucker and Shane. And so they were taken down for a formal interview. The rest of the witnesses were not determined to be either persons of interest or suspects at the time. When investigators sit down with Shane's sister, 59-year-old Kelly Moore, she is eager to tell detectives that Shane was a bad seed. When Kelly was interviewed by the detectives with the Medford Police Department, she talked about how Shane lived out at the property, how she believed he was using drugs out there. There's a big barn back here. His marijuana growing is here. 
there's a meat locker downstairs where I have every reason to believe that he's making methamphetamines. Kelly says she and her daughter Tucker were staying at the ranch with her mom because of her brother's dangerous behavior. She's afraid. She's afraid of shame. She's afraid of dying. She begged us to stay her, with her. So we reluctantly stayed with her. We didn't want to be out there. But according to Kelly, Shane took their presence as of that nine months ago, the tension came to a head. September of 2015, Shane was getting ready to leave the residence and Tucker said something. I think she cursed at him or something similar to that. So Shane picked up a plastic quart of oil and threw it back towards the front door, which was closed, um, but it was just the screen. And it, it went through the screen and hit her in the face. Knocked her down to the floor, it hit her so hard could have taken out her eye, but it hit her on the cheekbones, split open her skin. She's permanently scarred from it. And she called the police. There's a criminal case, and um, Shane, he ended up getting charged with fourth-degree assault, and the court issues a no-contact order. Kelly claims the move only further infuriated Shane, and the threats escalated. He was going to kill us if Tucker didn't take drop the charges, turn and drop the charges, he's going to kill us. Knowing Shane's biggest fear was to lose his share of the inheritance, Kelly harkened back to her days as an attorney and came up with what she hoped would be a solution. I was going to adulterate the will with additional language that said that if anything happened to my mother or my family or, you know, or property damage or anything else, because we've had damage to our cars that he would be immediately disinherited. I felt like that would be our insurance. We would be safe. I wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. So when Kelly realized Shane had asked the notary to prepare a grant deed to ensure the property was split equally between them instead of a will, she was furious. And I said, oh no, my mother is not signing this. This is her property. She's not signing this. And I ripped it into four pieces. And Shane was outside the sliding glass doors looking in and he started to come around to the front door and I thought to myself oh my god I locked the front door a no contact order was in place uh, on the date of this incident which would prohibit Shane from having contact with Tucker and I'm trying to shut the door and he's shoving it into me shoving it into me and I'm, and I'm leaning forward trying to shut the door take your time it's okay He was trying to come in. He was try trying to hurt me. And, and God only knows what else he was going to do. Though investigators feel a confession might be on the horizon, the interview takes an unexpected turn. Okay. And what happened next? That's the end of my statement. You don't want to tell us what happened after that? No, I don't. Just hours after the mysterious murder of 63-year-old Shane Moore, investigators in Jackson County are at a stalemate with Shane's sister, 59-year-old Kelly Moore. That was the end of my statement, as I think what she said. Very manipulative and arrogant. From my perspective, my, sister, my sister's blood, my parents dry. Ryan admits that Shane didn't have a job either, but he at least earned his keep. Shane was taking care of the farm. He was, he was working hard. He was working harder than I was going to work. Um, he was taking care of the orchards and clearing the creeks and cutting brush. According to Ryan, his brother has always been a gentle soul. Has Shane ever been a aggressive or violent person? As far as I you know? I have never witnessed him being aggressive or violent. However... Ryan says he has plenty of stories to tell about his sister Kelly's temper. Ryan said he cut ties with Kelly years ago after a, a family reunion. Ryan confronted Kelly about mooching off of her parents and uh, financially, and Kelly had taken offense to that and went after Ryan with a uh, fireplace poker. As for Tucker, Ryan says the apple didn't fall far from the tree. She's got you know, crazy rages. She is her mother's daughter. That's what I would, that's what I would say. 
Following the interviews with Ryan and Stacy, investigators suspect the story Tucker and Kelly are spinning isn't the whole truth, but they need to prove it. Finally, after six months of little traction in the investigation, detectives get a break from an unlikely source, Tucker. This is coming from the DA's office who's speaking with her defense attorney. There's a video from her cell phone from that day of the incident. Tucker's attorney claims the video will prove that Tucker acted in self-defense. The, the DA who's assigned to the case calls me and says, hey, you gotta come watch the video. Is Grandma coming out? Uh, I don't think she was aware of what was going on. Well, she has to come out and you have to take a no. dog. Shane needs to stay away no, from the property. The She's narrating, she's saying, I see this man, Shane, he's aggressive and dangerous. This man... This man, he threatened this woman's life, my mother, unless she signed that paper. He's just standing there, doing nothing. Wearing flip-flops and a tank top and a hat. He's not doing anything aggressive. She's not signing okay, a grand deed. She's not own. signing a grand deed. She's not signing a grand I was told it wasn't in She was told it was an inheritance, a will. An addendum what? to her will. A will. This is a grand deed. You're not signing a grand deed, mother. No, I Do you understand what a grand deed is? He's coming into the house. God damn it. What's the problem, Kelly? Pick up the gun. She's not signing a grand deed, Shane. I thought it was a will. She's not signing a grand deed. You son of a bitch. Kelly runs over to the front door, screaming, and then Tucker goes to the table and picks up a gun that's under a napkin that's sitting on the table and runs over to the front door. Get out of here. I mean, we watch it, and it's not proving their case, it's proving our case. After watching the shocking cell phone footage of Shane Moore's death, police in Jackson County are ready to charge Shane's niece, Tucker Moore Reed, with first-degree murder. Essentially, this is what we needed. I mean, all the self-defense claims got thrown out the door as soon as the video came to us. So it did the opposite of what the defense was hoping that it would do. But the wheels of justice turned slowly. I talked to the DA and he's like, now we're staying with manslaughter. Something came up where we had to take it back to grand jury anyways to change some verbiage in the manslaughter statute that needed to be added. It was about a year before we had the murder indictment reached by the grand jury after the video had surfaced. On September 4th, 2018, Jackson County investigators arrest 28-year-old Tucker Moore Reed again. This time upgrading the charges against her from manslaughter to murder in the 2016 shooting death of her uncle, Shane Moore. Following the arrest, Tucker appears before a judge for her bail hearing. She decided there will be no bail. That's when Tucker lost her mind. I mean, I was sitting two feet away from her, and it was it was loud. Even in another room, you know, even a room away, you, you could still hear these intense wailing. It, it was something that was just chilling at the time. Following the hearing, investigators are approached by a local filmmaker, Matthew Spickard. He tells them that while Tucker was out on bail last year, he cast her in a film. When she first bailed out, she decided that she was going to act in this movie from the dark that was filmed in Josephine County. They had wrapped up their filming by the time we got the murder indictment and arrested her on that charge later on. Matthew and his daughter Trinity, a writer on the film, Describe their first meeting with Tucker as she auditioned for the horror flick. Before shooting began, we held an open casting call on Facebook, and that's where we met Tucker, who was going by the name Wynn Reed at the time. He did stand out right away as someone that looked like could fit the role, um, the right age. I was very impressed with her. We were like, oh, yes, we have this wonderful, talented girl who's going to really take our movie to this next level. Matthew says that when he learned of the murder charge, he immediately reached out to police. They told us, in our movie, she shoots somebody. So we requested the director's cut of the movie for evidence to review and, and look. Investigators focus on one scene in particular. Following a party, Tucker's character finds herself armed and in the dark. It's a very intense atmosphere. There's lots of fear. There's lots of 
panic and confusion. The scene is her holding up a cell phone for a flashlight and a gun, you know, and then the guy comes out basically from this doorway of this other room trying to, like, talk her down and say, you know, give me the gun, and she just, out of her fear of the whole situation, shoots him. Basically, when she shoots this character, she absolutely believes she's doing it out of self-defense because of the situation. But when you see the movie, you'll see that, oh, that is technically murder. He played the lead role in a horror movie. Wonder why she was so good at the role. The scene's similarities with real life are both uncanny and unnerving. It's very bizarre. It's something you couldn't make up. But anyone eager to see Tucker's next performance, you know, asking why is it taking, you know, so long? What's going on? You know, what's the update? And it was always, you know, well, she's getting another attorney. Well, she got a different attorney. In the meantime, prosecutors worry Tucker's continued claims of self-defense will be a difficult hurdle to overcome during trial. The DAs were under the assumption that there would at least be one juror every single time that would would vote not guilty, possibly deciding this sounds like it was self-defense. By May 2020, nearly four years after the murder, 30-year-old Tucker finally settles on an attorney and soon reaches a deal with prosecutors. Tucker ended up with 75 months for a plea deal associated with a manslaughter in the second degree crime. That's what they settled on uh, with credit for time served, so essentially that means she'll get released in, in just a few years. We didn't want to have to retry this over and over again if the jury were not to come to a conclusion unanimously, either all guilty or all not guilty. I was just floored when they gave her six years. It's nowhere near enough. Those close to the case receive another blow when no charges are brought against Tucker's mother, Kelly Moore. There was no evidence of conspiracy, even though the thoughts were always in the back of our minds. There's a lot that I never was able to understand. I've never known anybody to be so loving and caring and giving as Shane and to be treated the way that he was by his own family. I just don't know. Just greed. That's what it comes down to is greed. Born in 1932, Concepcion Connie Reyes was raised in the Philippines with her three siblings. We lived in San Juan in the Philippines, which is around Manila. She was born there. She grew up there. She went to school in the Philippines. She came to the United States to go to teacher college and then stayed here and began her career. Her career had always been devoted to children. She worked in the local schools here in Kenosha as a teacher. In the late 1960s, after teaching grade school in the U.S. for multiple years, Connie got her master's degree in social work and began working with the Department of Social Services in Kenosha. She helped children in abusive homes. She would kind of monitor the situation to see if the children needed to be taken out of the homes. And I'm sure she saw a lot of not so pleasant things, but she was dedicated to her job. Connie was the kind of person that would do everything she could to try to reunify the family, but she also would do everything she could to pursue the termination of rights at the same time. My office prosecuted child abuse cases, so I knew Connie Reyes and uh, I admired her. She felt very strongly about the mission of children and family services. It was her life. She was so well respected as a social worker and an advocate for children. Connie was also deeply devoted to her family, and in 1978, she sponsored her brother Paul and his family for American citizenship. We actually lived with her in her two-bedroom apartment. We are a family of five, and we lived with her for a good month or two, you know, and she never complained. We didn't have furniture. You know, we had to leave a lot of our toys behind. Connie was a tremendous help in really helping us set up our household and getting us back on our feet in a new country. She was involved in our lives, we were involved in hers. Throughout the 1980s, as her nieces grew into young women, Connie remained a strong presence in their lives. We spent all holidays with her. She was a great cook. She was really our only family in Wisconsin. She was aunt, she was grandmother, she was uncle, she was everything to us. 
With a career she loved and her family behind her every step of the way, Connie was living the life she'd always imagined. She was certainly highly regarded by the judges and by the prosecutors and by the defense bar. In Kenosha County, she was a really wonderful, warm human being. I really enjoyed working with her, and I found her to be inspiring. As Kenosha investigators stand over Connie's lifeless body, they can't fathom who could have viciously murdered this pillar of the community. I remember because it was Easter Sunday, that's when I heard the news. I had expected to see her that night. Connie Reyes was very deeply loved by those people who knew her, especially by her family members and her friends. Outside the residence, detectives arrive and turn to the person who called 911, Connie's friend and co-worker, Joanne Slater. Joanne Slater and her husband were very close to Connie, and they hadn't talked to her in a day or two. So they went to the house, and that's when they discovered uh, her body in the house. Joanne had indicated that Connie Reyes was diabetic and that she was aware that she had gone home early from work on Thursday, April 12th. She had fallen ill, maybe due to the diabetes or, or something else. Joanne tells investigators she had a spare key to Connie's house and went to check on her. The paper boy, as I understand it, left some papers between the screen door and the front door. Joanne went to the front door and all the newspapers had fallen out. So it's obvious nobody didn't open that door. She unlocked the front door, and she went in and found Connie Reyes' body. Connie Reyes was found face down, and her clothing was disheveled. Her friend who found her called 911 and reported her death. Though Joanne is unable to provide any further details, investigators suspect she was the last person to see Connie alive on Thursday, April 12th. At that time, Kenosha News was delivered in the afternoon, so they were able to pinpoint that from the time she left work, which was around 11 o'clock or so, to uh, 4.30 in the afternoon would have been the time frame that uh, she was murdered. After speaking to Joanne, investigators begin documenting the crime scene, starting with Connie's body. It was readily apparent that Connie Reyes had been murdered and looked like she'd been strangled. The way her clothing was, it just looked to me like she'd been sexually assaulted. She was wearing a little blouse and a sweater up. Got the sweater over her head, the blouse up, the bra up. Detectives found a pubic hair and uh, a partial fingerprint on her glasses. The presence of the pubic hair was consistent with their belief that it had been a male assailant. Detectives fan out across the home in search of more evidence. The police conducted the examination of the home and determined that there was no evidence that there were things taken from the home. Her purse and wallet were still there and undisturbed. There was no sign of any forced entry, so that tells you right away it had to be someone that she knew and she let into the house. The assumption was that it was not a property crime. It was something that was motivated by personal animus toward Connie Reyes. For her to die the way she did and go through what she went through was shocking and made her stomachs turn. Investigators in Kenosha, Wisconsin, are desperate for a lead in the 24 hours following the discovery of social worker Connie Reyes murdered in her own home on Easter weekend, 1990. It pretty much sent shockwaves through our department because she was a very well-liked and very well-respected woman. Adding to the shock of Connie's death is the brutal way she met her end. There had been uh, a violent attack and sexual assault. Unfortunately, there isn't much at the scene for detectives to work with. The physical evidence showed that she was murdered, but we didn't have DNA testing available. A lot of times in a case like this, the focus would be on some uh, disgruntled former partner or someone of that nature, and there wasn't anybody like that to focus on. She was never married, and as far as any romantic relationships, I was not aware of any. Knowing Connie was dedicated to her job, investigators begin their search for potential enemies by looking at her most difficult clients. Connie was assigned the toughest cases. She was very deeply committed to the protection, safety, and welfare of children. 
She would occasionally have to remove the kids from a home for their benefit, as well as trying to get the parents back in line. It was kind of a last ditch, this is what I got to do. So they immediately began to focus on the possibility that it was one of her former clients, and particularly a male, given the nature of the sexual assault. There were so many different possible directions based on Connie's caseload, you know, people that she's had to deal with. And this could go over a period of years, not just who she was working with currently. Their suspect list dwindled to about four or five people that she had had some tension with families that work as far as removing kids from the home. That, of course, would be one of the top priorities to uh, bring these people in and talk to them and find out where they were, what they did that particular day or time frame, and if they had any alibi, and then follow up on the alibi. Some people interviewed were able to provide viable alibis. Eventually, they were dismissed as uh, potential suspects. There was no new viable information. As much as investigators dig, they're never able to gain traction. After about 48 hours, you're starting to work a cold case. Detectives had interviewed just about everyone that they needed to, and uh, their alibis either checked out or they had a reason why they were there. And after about two years, it just dried up. And with no new leads coming in, it goes to the back burner. As days turn to months, turn to years with no leads, Connie's loved ones struggle to cope with the lack of closure. Not knowing what happened to her was extremely frustrating. This didn't happen in a vacuum. Obviously, there were people that went in there and did this to her. Why is it difficult for anybody to figure this out? What are the police doing? What leads do they have? What are they following? What are they doing? You know, didn't get a lot of answers. The previous Detective Bureau captain kept this case closed but open in that if a new lead came in. And some of the detectives that worked on the case originally retired, and they were a little upset that they were never able to solve that crime. In June 1995, five years after the murder, the Connie Reyes case lands on the desk of newly minted detective Christine Funk. I was just promoted to detective, and my supervisor at the time said, well, just work on it when you have time or see what you can do with it, look into some of the old suspects and so forth. So I did that in my spare time, and I did try to develop a couple different suspects. She had this group of kids she was trying to help that were Satan worshipers. So I investigated that with another detective. We worked that together and tried to see if we could get anything out of these kids. When Detective Funk speaks to friends of the teens, she learns an alarming accusation. They were all confessing to killing her. Investigators immediately bring all four teens in for questioning. But it's clear they have a ringleader. Eric Sanchez was the main one. After speaking to him and speaking to a lot of people who were his friends, he was also confessing to them that he had killed her, but he didn't have any of the pertinent information. He didn't do it. As another lead dries up, when interviewing neighbors of Connie Reyes, detectives get a promising new suspect. Sergeant Brody lived across the street from uh, the Reyes residence. And when he was interviewed by Lieutenant Funk, he remembered that there was this person in the area that was acting inappropriately. Sergeant Rohde said that there was a neighborhood young man who was acting out aggressively against a lot of the women in the neighborhood at the time, just prior to her murder, like chasing them from their cars with their groceries to their back doors. The 38-year-old described by the sergeant is Terry Thompson, who lived just around the corner from Connie's house. So I talked to all the women in the neighborhood. There were several that did state that they were afraid of him. He'd be running around the neighborhood all the time at odd hours. On Wednesday, November 8th, 1995, detectives confront Terry. We asked him, could you please come down to the police station and we'd just like to talk to you about the Connie Reyes homicide. And he said, oh, of course I would. So he came with us and we had an interview room. He talked to us for hours, actually. As detectives turn up the heat on Terry, he makes a shocking confession. 
he came right up to the point where he said, yes, I went into Connie's house on such and such a day. It was near Easter time. He couldn't remember the day, but he said he pounded on the door and he got her to open the door and he said he did step into the house and that's as far as he would go. Five and a half years after Connie Reyes was strangled to death, one of her neighbors, Terry Thompson, has admitted to forcing his way into her house around the time of the murder. What he said was, I was angry with her because she refused to help me learn to read. He knew she was a social worker and he was trying to get her to help him to read. But this is as far as we got because his family had an attorney show up at the police department for him, so we had to stop. And then I actually received a letter saying I can never talk to him again. He did have some emotional and mental issues. Yet we couldn't tie him to the crime. We had no probable cause to charge him. Investigators' hands are tied. We couldn't have access to him. At the end of our um, dealings with Terry Thompson, we could not rule him out as a suspect because of his admission of going into the house and his behavior. At yet another dead end, Detective Funk decides to keep tabs on Terry while revisiting the evidence from the crime scene. I did run everything that was available to me through DNA again when I got the case, but it was degraded over time because the way they stored it back then was not proper and things got moldy and useless. The hair guy at the FBI did whatever he could with that, and because it was a fragment, we couldn't match it to anybody. So there was actually no DNA evidence that we could use. As years tick by, Connie's family remains haunted by her death. I remember um, for several years after my aunt's murder, I would have dreams where I would be in a room with her. And she'd say, I have something very important to tell you. And then I would wake up and I would never know what she was trying to tell me. I believe she wasn't at peace until this question could be answered about what really happened to her and who did this to her. Finally, 13 years after the murder, on February 25th, 2003, a call comes in from a woman named Linda Goulon that shakes the dust off this cold case once and for all. I called the Kenosha Police Department and I had asked if they had ever solved Connie Reyes's case. And they said, no, we have not. And I said, well, I might be able to help you. Linda is a former Kenosha resident who recently moved to Mississippi with her husband, Chester. In February of 2003, they were staying with their good friend, Santa Bobo. She had taken them in because they were out of a job. They had no money. According to Linda, things got rocky when Chester stole Sandra's silverware to try to make some quick cash. She threatened to go to the police. Then he finally came to and, and told her that he pawned it. Sandra gave him an opportunity to go get it back, but he didn't do it. So Sandra Bobo called the Monroe County Sheriff's Department, and they actually brought Chester in, and we're going to charge him with theft. Chester was afraid of being arrested uh, in Mississippi for the theft. And somehow in a conversation, he admitted that he had been involved in his homicide. He started s stating things like, the police in Kenosha are after me. They want to know about that homicide or that murder of the social worker. I can't go back there. They can't know about me. After hanging up with Linda, Detective Funk springs into action. I then went to Captain McNamara and I said, we got to go to Mississippi. On March 9th, 2003, Detective Funk arrives in Aberdeen, Mississippi, and decides to speak with Sandra Bobo first. So, we got to ask him questions about where were you pawned it that he was talking about. He, he was scared to death of the police. What was he saying about Kenosha? He felt he was in trouble with Kenosha. He said that um, he was also running for the police in Kenosha. And I said, what has Kenosha got to do with what you're doing down here? Sandra says it was then that Chester brought up two of their mutual acquaintances from back in Wisconsin, Gaylord Gomez and Linda Dancer. 
We can see it. Why is they were Linda involved in this? They weren't here when we stole the silverware. What are they holding against you? He said, I know for a fact that they were the guilty people. I said, how do you know that? Why are you sitting there saying, you know, he said, because he was with them when they killed the social worker. And I just froze. He said, it was horrible. A horrible, horrible death that nobody would ever want to see. Has he told you that he's fearful of Gaylord and Linda? He said he was scared to death of Gaylord and Linda. That if he talked, they would be after him. Sandra was friends with Chester, but she knew Gaylord Gomez and she knew Linda Dancer from the past. But she stayed away from them. She says, I really didn't like them. According to Sandra, Linda and Gaylord may have had a motive for wanting to harm Connie. Did you have much contact with Gaylord and Linda while you were living in Kenosha? I did there for a while, uh, until I found out that their, why their kids had been taken away from them. Sandra says Linda had lost custody of her daughters for putting them in dangerous situations with adult men. Did they ever say anything to you about who took their, who their social worker was, or... They just said that uh, they were going to get eaten. And I didn't believe too much about it, not at that time. After wrapping up her interview with Sandra Bobo... Detective Fonk brings Chester's wife, Linda Goulon, in for questioning. Any information that I got, I put together on my own through all this time. I just told him that weird things was happening, and I told him that since we've been down here, my husband had been acting real funny. According to Linda, while she and Chester lived in Kenosha for the decade after Connie Reyes' murder, he was always a little on edge. But once they moved to Mississippi in 2003, he seemed even more paranoid. You know how you are when you have to watch over your back because you're afraid if you mess up, they're going to get you? Well, that's how he used to be once we got moved to Mississippi. Linda Goulan told me things that only someone at the homicide would have known. For instance, that she was sexually assaulted. We never put that in the paper. A couple other details about what clothing she had on. He was saying things like that. And he could have only known that if he was in there. Detective Funk immediately tracks down Chester Goulon a few towns away in Tupelo, Mississippi, to hear his side of the story. I'd ask him to come with me, to talk to me. And he said, sure. I talked to Chester for probably four hours, just asking him what's going on here. Tell me what, what you told your wife and tell me what you told Sandra. And he wasn't giving up a lot. He was just saying, oh, I just heard this or I heard that. And he was very nervous, very uptight. Finally, after hours of intense questioning, Chester begins to crack. We talked and talked and I got him to tell me what happened that night and how it happened. He had kept this inside for 13 years, and I believe he wanted to tell somebody. 13 years after the unsolved murder of Connie Reyes, Chester Goulon's guilt has finally consumed him, and he's ready to tell his story. Chester tells Detective Funk that Connie Reyes was the social worker on his friend Linda Dancer's child custody case. Linda Dancer had three daughters, three little girls, who were removed from her custody by Connie Reyes, but she was allowed supervised visitation. There were some issues between Gaylord and Linda in the home, and Connie apparently felt it was imperative to remove the children until they resolved some of their issues. Linda was very upset and had been very upset with Connie Reyes for a number of months because of her children being taken away. According to Chester, Gaylord and Linda were scheduled to have a visitation on Thursday, April 12th, 1990, until Connie became ill. So later on in the evening now, they hook up with Chester Goulon. They pick him up at work. Linda is so angry about this no visitation that she's telling them that we're going to go get Connie. She's going to get what she deserves for not letting her see her children. The decision was made that they were going to go over there, and they needed Chester Gulan to knock at the door because uh, Connie Reyes had opened the door for either Gaylord Gomez or Linda Dancer. These three losers sitting in a restaurant 
drinking coffee and planning a homicide. Chester says he reluctantly agreed and rode with Linda and Gaylord to Connie's home that evening. When she opened the door, Gaylord Gomez put his foot in the door and then forced his way in. Linda shoves Connie to where Connie hits her head on the counter, falls to the floor, and then she's telling Gaylord to get her, to get her, give her what she deserves. According to Chester, Gaylord did as he was told. Gaylord is now on top of her, and Linda's down on the floor. Gaylord punches her in the face. We always thought Connie was bitten, that someone bit her left thigh. Well, that turned out to be boot kicks from either Linda Dancer or Gaylord Gomez. Chester claims the scene was so brutal, he eventually went back to the car and waited for Linda and Gaylord. So Chester Gillen inculpated himself in the homicide, but he denied that he actually murdered Connie, and he also denied that he sexually assaulted her. He was going to be under arrest, and I informed him, you know, Chester, you were there, you're part of this. There was plenty of evidence to charge first-degree homicide. Kenosha police are now eager to question Linda Dancer and Gaylord Gomez. But first, they pull Linda's file from the Department of Social Services and discover a deeper connection between Linda and Connie. Linda had a very difficult life. She had been the product of the foster care system herself. It said she had to go to three different foster homes, and at that time, her social worker was actually Connie Reyes. She already disliked Miss Reyes. When she was removed from her mother's home, it was by Miss Reyes, so there was an animosity there. By the time she was 25 years old, Linda had three kids with multiple partners who did not stick around. Then, in 1985, she met and married Gaylord Gomez. It was an unstable, dysfunctional relationship that existed between Linda Dancer and Gaylord Gomez. Gaylord and Linda were married at the time of the homicide. Linda is a very persuasive individual when it came to Gaylord. She could get him to do anything and everything that she wanted, or she would really be a nasty person to him and make his life miserable. I had met them in 1985. Gaylord was always scary. Chester, he was the shy person. He was the one that always tagged along, you know. We did everything together. All three of these individuals, in my personal opinion, they're all very street smart people. Uh, Linda had a history of stealing and being uh, kind of a troublemaker. With Chester in police custody in Mississippi, Detective Funk tells her colleagues in Kenosha to track down Linda and Gaylord immediately. Linda Dancer was in Kenosha, as was uh, Gaylord Gomez. They were divorced at this point in uh, 2003. That was a sign to go look for Gaylord. I had an address where we last knew Gaylord to live, and sure enough, Gaylord was there. So I asked him if he would come to the police department. He came uh, voluntarily. In the course of the interview, Gaylord denied anything about being involved. Detective Strash pinpointed that, I know you're not telling me the truth. I know this, this, and this, and this is what Chester told us. Like Chester, Gaylord eventually breaks down. He got to the point where he admitted it and let it out and became uh, very detailed and graphic in uh, what happened. But according to Gaylord, things didn't happen exactly how Chester had previously told detectives. Gaylord Gomez said that it was Chester Gulan who strangled Connie Reyes. Gaylord admits to sexually assaulting Connie, but claims he wasn't the only one. Chester, he says, well, I'm going to get in on this, and he does the same thing. With both men pointing the finger at each other, investigators turn to Linda Dancer, hoping to finally learn the truth. When she did her interview, she sat down on the floor. She said that Gaylord Gomez is the one that strangled Connie Reyes, and that she, Linda Dancer, had stepped between Gaylord and Connie to try to protect Connie. Linda Dancer, of course, doesn't accept any responsibility. That was not consistent with Chester Gulen's testimony and Gaylord Gomez's testimony. It was that Linda Dancer was the motivating force behind this home invasion, homicide, and sexual assault. Detectives have heard enough, and on March 11, 2008,
2003, authorities charged Chester, Linda, and Gaylord with first-degree murder. It's not long before the news reaches Connie's family. I found out while I was at work, so I quick rushed home. Um, I was just shocked. I, I couldn't believe it after so long, you know. But I commend this lady that called the police and turned her husband in. It was wonderful to hear that finally we have answers to this or we can now maybe get some answers to this. Perhaps there can be some justice. After 13 years, Kenosha police have finally arrested Linda Dancer, Linda's ex-husband Gaylord Gomez, and their friend Chester Goulon for the brutal murder of Connie Reyes. The case is based upon what we call interlocking confessions. But we didn't have DNA testing. We didn't have physical evidence that linked any one of these three people to this crime. There was one piece of evidence that was left, and it was a fragment of a pubic hair. And because it was a fragment, we couldn't match it to anybody. So um, there was actually no DNA evidence that we could use. With no concrete evidence to go on, Prosecutors must rely on the statements of each of the defendants to close the case. Each of them point to the finger to everybody else, and you simply can't try all three of them together. What you do in a case like that is you prosecute the case first that has the, the best confession. That was Chester Gulen. I did talk to Chester one more time with a final attempt to try to get him to put himself in there, and I was able to do that. He did later on that afternoon. He said yes. I was in there. I saw everything that happened. I said, Chester, they're telling me you had sex with Connie, too, when, after she was already dead. He would never admit to that. So Chester Gulen's second statement inculpated himself in the homicide, but he denied that he actually murdered Connie, and he also denied that he sexually assaulted her. Though he denies his involvement... Chester does give detectives one final chilling detail about the murder. He said they all sang a song after it. After they killed her and moved her body, they sang, Plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is. And they were singing that song as they left the house. It's just so dreadful that these people are responsible for the loss of a noble person like Connie Reyes. I was like, oh my God, I couldn't believe that Linda and Gaylord and, and Chester had anything to do with this. And I mean, I felt it right down in my heart for Miss Reyes. It just tore me apart that they did stuff like that to her. As prosecutors head to trial, Gaylord has a change of heart. The idea was to try Chester Gulan first, Gaylord Gomez second, and Linda Dancer third. Gaylord Gomez threw that off a little bit because he decided to plead guilty which is very unusual for someone to plead guilty to a murder case, but that was what happened. Gaylord saw the light, and he pled guilty to avoid going to court. It was very difficult for him to testify. So then we tried Chester Gulan, and I called Gaylord Gomez as a witness. We testified, and he implicated Chester Gulan, and um, Chester Gulan was convicted. And then we did uh, the dancer the very next week. Prosecutors assert that Linda was the true mastermind behind this brutal crime. It was just her personality that she got what she wanted or she was she became aggressive. And, and I think that's why she snapped that day. She didn't get her girls for Easter. And that's what did it. It's not so much that she did this out of love for her children. She did this out of resentment for the fact that somebody else would presume to tell her how she's going to live her life or take something away from her that belonged to her. She wanted to get even with Miss Reyes for taking her children away and then canceling that last-minute visitation. Another important piece of the puzzle was Connie was the caseworker that pulled Linda and her siblings out of the home and placed into a foster home. Linda hated Connie so much that she wanted her dead. Between the three partial confessions, Linda's defense seems bleak. You could see the jurors at the time were just shocked at, at some of the information that they were receiving. You can imagine 12 people forced to listen to what was really ugly information. So it, it was an uphill battle to defend Linda Dancer. I fought as hard as I could given the circumstances. Like Gaylord and Chester, Linda is found guilty of first-degree murder. 
I did not go every day to the trials, but I did go to the sentencings, all three. They let us um, say some things. Um, they let us make some comments before sentencing, so I did do that. That was tough. I read some Bible verses, and then I remember for Gaylord Gomez, um, when he left the room, he yelled, F you! They all got mandatory life imprisonment. When you get involved in a case, you live it every day until you get to the end. And I was just so relieved to see them all found guilty and all sent to prison for the rest of their life. I felt relieved and hopeful that my aunt was finally at peace. In 2007, four years after his sentencing, Chester dies in prison. Linda remains behind bars until her death in 2020. My biggest regret is that they weren't convicted more quickly after her homicide. I regret that they had one day of freedom after they committed this terrible crime. It was a violent, horrible crime, and she didn't deserve any of it. She was doing her job. She was watching out for these children. What they did to her was inexcusable, and she didn't deserve any of it. I will say it's still hard to talk about, even after all these years. It really is. You know, and she took a part of our, they took a part of our family away, and um, you just never really get over it.